Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Trusting this setup here. I know it's loud right this second. Old. Trusting it won't be too uh, bad of a connection. In fact, let me do this. Good enough. All right, tonight during our time together, we are going to be looking uh, still, continuing our look at Romans chapters 5 through 8. And tonight we're going to focus in chapter 6, and we're going to make that, we're going to take that to another, ver another chapter in one of Paul's letters that has been, to me, one of the most misunderstood chapters in the Bible, one of the most questioned, debated, and unfortunately dispensationalized portions of Scripture in the Bible. But tonight, uh, I hope to bring a little clarity to these things because the Lord is really bringing some clarity into my heart now as far as being able to articulate it. <clears throat> That's another question, hopefully, uh, that will be the case. But Romans 6, or chapters 5 through 8 of Romans, deals with a very simple contrast, but a contrast that is basically the theme of the entire scripture. Uh, first, second. Old, new. Above, beneath. Heaven, earth. Death, life. Dark, I mean, I mean sorry, life, death. Uh, light, darkness. Every, every single contrasting uh, verbiage however it's been put throughout the scripture, is always, always in reference to the contrast he's making in the first chapter, in, in the fifth chapter of Romans and throughout. Because none of the things, none of the phrases or the wording is, is even valid without reference to the man that is the substance of those terms, death, darkness, life, light, however, whichever phrase. What I'm telling you is that those phrases, and therefore the meaning of the contrast, no matter how it's worded, always relates back to two men, Adam and Christ. And so in the chapter before us, chapter 5, Paul is showing and demonstrating that contrast and doing it in a very beautiful way if you look at it in the light of the grace of God because what he's done from chapter 5, and we've talked about this so I'm just kind of rushing through this as an overview. In chapter 5, what we've already talked about, he has taken one man, and this we can read verse 12 through 14. Chapter 5 of Romans, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So one man, and by this one man, death, sin, sin and death. That was a state, a condition 
that was brought about and determined by this one man and was the very state that all men who were born of this seed partook of merely by birth. We've already said it. What did they have to do? He's already said it here. They did not, you go on through chapter four, verse 14, <clears throat> so death passed upon all men. Just because one man sinned and death came because of sin, death has now passed upon all men, for all have sinned. But only one sin. But what you're seeing is his contrast and showing how God, God's relationship to all was, for, was, was, only de was determined by one man, always, never any other way. God never knew men separate from their relation to a specific man, okay? The question is the kind of man, what seed, what, what the seed of which man is in you, that's the determining factor. That's the determining factor. <clears throat> Remember, I think we talked about in the last class, when the condemnation, it said Jesus didn't come. God didn't send his son into the world in John 3. In John 3, 16 and 17, 18, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And we said that that's the salvation or the deliverance that Paul cries out for in the uh, seventh chapter of Romans. That is the deliverance that he knows that he is in need of because he beholds that every time he attempts to do the good, which is a, the law testified of the good, the perfect, the, the holy and the heavenly, but every time he implemented the the ability, the capability, and the uh, uh, effectiveness of this man and, and, and utilize the flesh, this man, the earthly man, the natural man, to, to bring about this result. This man was always exposed to be who he is. This was never the, a result. This was never uh, the end of the matter. This could never be uh, done because it was already determined that the seed determined all things. So when he came not to condemn the world, so why, why didn't he have to come condemn the world? Because, because of this man and the seed of this man, the world who was born of the seed of this man was already condemned because that was a state that was already determined by this man, Adam by a man of sin and death. Follow me. So, that was already so. So he didn't come to further condemn. He came to save or deliver from death those who would hear the voice of the Son of Man. Those who would hear him who says, I am the resurrection. And the life. And that's what we're going to deal with tonight is the resurrection and the life in a way that maybe you haven't considered it. Maybe religion has uh, misinterpreted it out of to the point where it has no meaning to us anymore. So that's the distinction. And so he's showing where this man determines the state of all men who are born of that seed. So this man, much more so because it's greater, <clears throat> it's no longer a testimonial. Uh, picture. Now it's the absolute divine intention and substance God had in mind from before the foundation of the world that Adam was merely a semblance of, which it says here in the last uh, part of chapter 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the semblance of Adam, his transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. It was, it's what we have in Christ now is no longer testimonial. It is the much more. It is the intended goal of such a testimony where one man determined all things 
in Adam, it was just a mere picture where to those who would come to be born of another man's seed, of the seed of another man, then that man would, and the life of that man would determine the state of all who are found in him and in whom he is found. And that is a beautiful picture. He's showing here the, the contrast and how God has, the, 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 the contrast and the transition that God has brought about between these two men. And the cross is where this division was made. This is where it says in Ephesians that God uh, put away this, this man forever by nailing the commandments to the tree and doing away with the ordinances that were against us. And that doesn't mean he nailed the commandments to the tree. It means he nailed the man over whom those commandments had government. A man under the law, as long as a man liveth, he's under the law. So this man had to die. So the law would no longer have a man over which to rule. But that's not the only part of it. Then a man who God raised up from the dead, that man had to live so that he would be the embodiment of everything the law demanded, but this man, by the law, could never bring about cause. The law itself testified of the life, but couldn't provide the life of which it testified, is what Paul says in Galatians 3. So, what a beautiful picture of the grace of God. And that's why he says where sin did abound in abundance. And the law came so that the aboundingness of that sin, the abundance of that sin, the depth of that hole and the depth of the depravity of man could be seen as for what it truly was. It was a depravity like nothing else. It was, a, it was a depth of darkness and death like no, you couldn't even imagine. And you knew it was to demonstrate to them a frustration, not because of what they did or did not do, but because of who they were by natural birth. And you can't alleviate yourself of that just by correcting habits, just by correcting actions. There's no correcting to this depravity, this abounding sin that the law demonstrated to be exceedingly sinful, Paul says, in these chapters, in Romans 7. Because in Romans 7, he's given his own personal experience of what he's already addressing here. And how those two men are so contrary one to another the picture of this perfect man can never, uh, uh, this man of sin can never live up to the outline, the testimony of this perfection, let alone reach it. And salvation is not, the salvation he came to bring is not to this man. Listen to this, because this is where we mess up in religion. We think God offers salvation to man to rid him of his badness and bestow goodness, to rid him of his evilness and bestow holiness or righteousness. No, salvation is not to man. Salvation is out from a man into another man. That's the salvation he came to bring. And therefore, those that are, it says, those that believe on the Son of Man are not condemned. But those who believe not are condemned already. The, to be brought out of condemnation is to be delivered out from a man whom can, who can be and is of God condemned by the law. Because he's not, he's not perfect. You see what I'm saying? To, to ever put this upon us and make that our goal, perfectness and perfection and righteousness and holiness, is putting is, is, is expecting out from this what is only perfectly embodied here. Okay, so we'll move on from there. So he goes on and says that 
where sin abounded. The law entered that sin might abound or be seen to be abounding in its nature, ruthless, without hope, leaving man in the most miserable of states. Wretched man and I am is a, is a cry out from this understanding of what the law showed him just to see the law kept frustrating this because he knew he couldn't be, couldn't do, couldn't perform what it demanded because it demands perfection and you're not that and you'll never be that but the much more abounding grace of God has, has not perfected this man but has brought into your soul the life of a perfect man. That's the much more of this abounding of grace unto the soul. So in verse 20, that as sin hath reigned unto death or governed uh, and, and, and brought about death or separation from God, even so grace is now reigning through righteousness unto, unto eternal life. We're going to talk about that in Jesus Christ our Lord. There's where the victory is found. And we'll talk about that because that's what it's talking about. True victory. Reigning in life. Victory over sin and death. Therefore, the law. That was the very power of sin and death. Now, and in the light of such a beautiful transaction of the Spirit, a transition from the one to the other, this work of salvation that God has wrought in the soul of those who are now born of that seed, the perfect seed of a perfect man, the incorruptible seed. And that word is very important as we proceed tonight. In the light of that, he asks this question, pointing back to all that he has said in the contrasts that he's just made. And again, prefacing the whole chapter of 5 saying, justified by faith. What's the justification by faith refer to? Chapter 4 where he says, Abraham being dead in his own body, dead in Sarah's womb, realized he was unable to perform and bring about God's intent. Because God's intent was about a seed. But the seed that he was after was impossible for this man, Adam or, Adam or Abraham, in this, in this testimony, to bring forth. Couldn't do it. And even in his attempts, his efforts, uh, works of the flesh, and his saying, well, I'll, I'll do it one way or another. I'll bring it about. We see God had nothing to do with it. God didn't recognize it as his son. It couldn't be. Even though, and this is what we're talking about last week, or the last time, last session, this question. Even though he cried out, fell on his face before God to let Ishmael live in his sight, or to bend his will so that Ishmael could be the recipient of an inheritance that belongs to another, God would not have it. Because God had a specific seed, a specific son in mind. Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for this will, one will not be heir with my son. Now that was, that was Sarah's words, but Paul attributes it to God in Galatians. So, in the light of such a transaction, we're now... This transaction, this transition has happened. Uh, translation out of death unto life, out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the dear son. Since that has happened in the light of that. And prefacing it with we have now peace with God. And we talked about that last week. Through our Lord Jesus. By whom are, and the word there is actually in, not through. In the Lord Jesus by whom also we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand as rejoicing in, in the hope that has come, Christ in you, the hope. And that hope is going to be very important when we get to chapter 8. See, verse 1 and 2 of chapter 5 just set us up for this because in this grace wherein we stand, which is Christ himself, this is the grace of God in whom we stand. 
made unto us all sufficiency, all spiritual blessing. And it's in that one, in that grace we stand, accessing that grace by faith, because we said last week, faith is not behold a man who needs to be fixed, uh, problems that need to be solved, but a man who is perfect in every way, that has no deficiency. A, sin, a salvation without reference to sin. That's, that's what faith beholds. So faith accesses or comes to the face of the grace in which we stand. And in that, we hope. We rejoice in the hoped for glory of God because we see the hoped for glory of God to be Christ in us. And there is rejoicing in that realization and that reality that is being realized. So in the light of all of that, he asked this question, what then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And again, last week we, we dealt with that. Shall we seek in the earth what can only be found in the heaven? Shall we get God to bestow to Ishmael what belongs to Isaac? Shall we try to make the spirit and the flesh work in harmony together to produce what God has already performed and, and produced and bestowed in fullness to a soul? Shall we in in implore God to make the flesh an exhibition of what is only exhibited in the face of the spirit, of the man of spirit? See, here we pray in this understanding, and this is what it's saying. If this man of sin is still your reference point, should this man still be the reference point for your soul in the light of such a transition and translation out from the one to the other? Shall we still live with this man and the state that he procured and determined as our reference point and implore God to, bend, to bless this man with his grace to get him out of his mess or to bestow him with spiritual benefits. Also, separate from a living relationship with a perfect man where this man is made unto the soul what this man could never be. See what I'm saying? It is, it is just that. We, we talked about it last week, so I won't go in there anymore. But God forbid, how shall we that are dead live any longer therein? And we went into many verses with that, like Galatians. How shall you still be under the ordinances like touch not, taste not, handle not, seeing that you're dead to that? Because you're dead to the man who was under such ordinances, such, such law. Because you're found in a man who is who in, against whom there is no law, who, whose life is the very substance out from which the law proceeded, who cast that shadow of, out of his own being and is the substance of it in you, is the righteousness for which, it, for which it looked and testified now present in your soul and you're gonna ask God to further perfect such a perfection that has been given? You, by your fleshly efforts, are going to ask God to, to empower you and your fleshly efforts to produce and perform what is only embodied and perfectly realized in this man. That's, that's unfortunately the position of most Christians today. That's unfortunately the position of most believers Today. Therefore, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. What is his death? What is this death into which we have been baptized? Because listen, people are making the death a process that we have to do where we're steadily and steadily killing the old man. But he's going to go on knowing this in verse 6, that our old man is crucified with him. There is no continual beating down 
of this man. You're dead to this man. This man no longer is in the picture. This man is out. Dead forever, separated from God. Has nothing to do with what you have now in Christ. No reference point to this at all. Because of a baptism that has brought such a final and utter transformation or transition from the one to the other. Baptism. Paul, and see it's going to go into what we, what we talked about uh, earlier and, and, and what we're going to get in tonight, but Peter deals with it. Peter deals with it. We just go to 1 Peter chapter 3. And we'll just skip all the way down to 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. See? Here's the baptism he's referring to here. And he's going to tell you, he's going to qualify it and, and clarify what this baptism is not, first and foremost. Even baptism doth now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Not fixing this. Not just fixing this. That's not what the baptism was. Remember, he is liking it, likening this baptism to the, to, the, to the flood. To Noah. Where one man, it says here, eight souls. But we, we read in Genesis how it's truly worded there is one man remained. Only Noah remained and those that were with him. Those that were with him in the ark. And this baptism, like that one, doth save us. Did he save the earth or did he save one man and those who were with him out from the earth? It wasn't just washing it off. It was totally putting it away. Remember, we, we've read it already. That, and he's going to say it again here, but we read it in uh, 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 Colossians about sanctified. How we've been circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands. How does he, how does he define that circumcision? How does he define it? Putting off of a body of sins. That's this. Not just cleaning it up, putting it off. Not just cleaning it and making it better, destroyed. Because he's going to say in Rome, he's going to say that here in a little bit in Romans in Romans six, and we'll read it. But it's not just the putting away of the filth of the flesh. No, because salvation is not of this man; it is out from this man. Uh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. What is that? A good conscience. It means the soul's reference point is no longer evil, but good. The soul's reference point is joined to the good that remains. A good conscience. Conscience means your, your understanding or your knowledge is joined to something. A good conscience means that your knowledge, your understanding is joined to that which is good. An evil conscience is the opposite. It's joined to that which is evil. And Paul in Romans 7, just like the Jews themselves, his example was he was taking an evil conscience because it was a conscience that was referencing this wretched, evil man. And looking at a testimony of that which was good. The need was this baptism. That's why in this baptism, once this baptism has been brought about by the Spirit of God, new birth, this baptism is, has been brought about through the work and operation of the Spirit. It doesn't matter if you're Jew, Gentile, circumcised, uncircumcised, none of that matters because there's only one that remains. One man, Christ, all in all, determining the state of all in whom he lives. Baptism. And this 
Look at this. It's the answer of a good conscience toward God. How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, we're going to talk about that. Because this is what he's saying here in Romans. It's the resurrection being described. Not a future one because there's no such thing. The resurrection was a reality that even the Jews realized was to be brought about in a person, in the person of the Messiah when he comes. The problem was with, 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 with uh, Lazarus' sister that she did not realize that the Messiah who is and would bring in his very coming, the resurrection, was the one who was standing in front of her. The resurrection brought about this transition from from death unto life and from the old creation to the new creation. That's the work of the Spirit. And that's the reality of, our resur of resurrection. Baptism, baptized, this is, I'm going back at Romans 6 again, verse 3. Know ye not so many of us as were baptized, were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death, his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Now remember, this is not, not dead in, but dead to. This death of Christ is not dead in this man. It's dead to it. That's why we must be crucified with him. That's why this is baptized into his death. That's, that's where it's been out from this man because his death was to sin, to Adam, to that man, to that whole creation, that whole universe, that whole state. And he came into that state, took upon himself that state, born, took upon himself that man. Why? He says it. We're going to read verses 4 through 6 here just to get the whole synopsis of it. Therefore, buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And we're going to talk about that life. The newness of life. Not a new lease on life. Not a new life for this man. But a new life altogether. Newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall all be also of resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with, that the body of sin might be destroyed. See, crucified, this death, the transaction, the transition, didn't fix anything about this man. It destroyed, the body of sin was destroyed. This reference is very well to that he might, he died so that he might destroy the works of the devil. You're of your father, the devil. That the body of sin might be destroyed. Remember, we've already said that. Circumcision not made with hands in the putting off of a whole body of sin. That henceforth, from this moment on, we should not serve sin or be the slaves of sin any longer. Remember, sin's not what you do. Sin is a man in whom you lived. That our soul would come, not only in the, to be, see, he's talking to believers, so it's not just about sin, uh, not doing bad things. That's, that's not the issue. It's about not only possessing a life that is without reference to sin, but beholding the life that is in you that has no reference to sin. This is, this is what we're addressing here, but we're talking about newness of life. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Dead to it. If you're dead to it, you're free from it. That is a state procured by this man because he died to it once 
and for all. And in that he is going to go on in verse 10 and say it, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. I love that. Because in the Weiss translation, verse 10 is, is, is written like this, that he died to sin once and for all. It's not now him dying to it and him saying you can do it too. Or him giving us the ability to die to sin on a daily basis. It's about a soul coming to a daily recognition of a death that he's already brought about and a state of life that he's already brought in to the soul. Where it is a daily comprehension of being severed forever from this man and living only by the life of this one. Being born of the incorruptible seed, having no reference to corruption at all. We did, we've dead with Christ. We believe we should also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Remember he said, you, you will not see your Holy One enter back in or return to corruption. No, once and for all, put it all forever. Then return to it. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Jesus Christ our Lord, through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, it's about reckoning, recognition, reckoning, recognition of a state that he's already determined because he's present. Okay. Paul is showing here not only that God did a transition, but how he brought it about. It's through the death, burial, and resurrection of this man by putting away, putting off from himself this man. And now if this man is in you, if you're born of this man's seed, then there is a recognition, a reckoning, an accounting, an inward acknowledgement of such a reality that must take place. Not to make it so, but so your soul can enjoy the reality of it being so. Where your soul can be transformed, if you will, so that sin will no longer be a reference point upon which you look. That the form of flesh and blood will no longer be the place you look to find the evidence of what is only found in the person of spirit, life, and truth. You see, this is a transition done, wrought of God, Paul is saying. No need to go into the externalities to try to make flesh and blood an exhibition of perfection because perfection has already been bestowed to the soul in a perfect life. Because you can live, and this is what he will talk about in Romans 7, given his own personal experience under the law, but he's showing them that we can still be in Christ, not under the law, but in Christ, yet ignorant of that life that God has bestowed. And look at this perfect law. See ourselves. Be deceived. And live in the deception. And the condemnation. And the torment. That he lived under the law. And unfortunately most Christians live right there today. Why? Not because. They don't have this man in them. Because they're unaware that he's there. Not because they don't have a perfect salvation, a perfect, unbreakable, unbroken, eternally secure relationship with God. But that they have not seen the one who is that perfect, unbreakable, eternally secure relationship with God. I'm telling you salvation is certain because he's in you. And there can't be anything more certain than that. The transition has taken place. This work has happened by new birth. And newness of life is a present state. But you can live ignorant of the life that is present. And still have this as your reference point. Earth, natural, flesh, and blood. And when this is your reference point, And you're trying to reach this goal. You'll never arrive in your understanding and in your soul's experience. When the fact is, if you're in Christ 
and He's in you. If He's in you and you're born again, you've already come to the goal because the goal has been reached in the person of Christ in you. You didn't reach it. Basically, I could say it this way. You didn't reach the goal. The goal reached you by the grace of God. And he is in you as the I am. As the second man, the Lord from heaven. The second without reference to sin. This is newness of life that is our absolute state. Now I'm going to stop there. We'll go into the chapter 6 more in our next time together. But let's just start reading here. In this portion of scripture that has been so misunderstood. But is in absolute direct reference to what Paul says in chapter 6 of Romans. Now, I only have a, about 5 or 10 minutes to actually just introduce it. But I think we needed this kind of to, to bring us to where we where we are. Chapter 15 of Romans. Now, verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Now see, he brings it from the person of Christ to the state that he wrought and brought about for all who are in him. And if Christ be not risen, verse 14, listen to this. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain and your faith also vain. And we are found false witnesses of God, for we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. We're liars. And if so be that he, that the dead rise not, or if so be that the dead rise not, we're, we're false witnesses preaching a vain thing. Verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And look at this. Remember, this is all reference. Sin, death, sin, sin, sin. Not some things you do, but a man, a state procured by a seed. This Adamic corruptible seed. A state of corruption that you were born into naturally. Missing the mark. And you couldn't hit it if you tried. In all your efforts, you couldn't do it. Christ be not raised. Your faith is vain. Empty. The word vain there means empty as to result. Meaning it's empty and has no capacity to bring about the result desired. Empty. That's going to be important because he's going to talk in Romans 8 about vain and vanity and hope fulfilled. Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Not only that, and ye are yet in your sins. Why? See, he's bringing it right here. We're not talking about some future thing. We're talking about the resurrection with direct reference to whether you're in your sins or not. Because the resurrection has everything to do with a deliverance out from a man of sin and a man of perfect life and righteousness raised up by the glory of the Father living in the soul as righteousness, sanctification, redemption. And if that man is not raised, there is no resurrection because the resurrection is not raised. His raising, the fact that he is raised, is the means. Oh, this is... Those that hear the voice of the Son of Man and obey, they shall live out from the dead and they shall live. Believeth on me, he shall be raised up in the last day. This is 
This is the same thing here. This is, he's talking about the same thing. And we're going to talk about it, but God, Paul, because God didn't. Paul never distinguishes between law and the man under it. It's all the same. The law is not just a Jewish thing. The law is over a man, man, as long as he lives, because law condemns, uh, law testifies of perfection, and therefore everything that's brought to the light of such perfection is condemned as imperfect. Whether Jew or Gentile, and that's why he says it, Jew or Gentile in chapter 3 of Romans, they're all under sin because they're of the same seed, of the same man. So if he is not raised up, there is no hope for your deliverance from this man. And you can preach it all you want, but unless there is a reality of a living person, a life raised by the glory of God living in you, not just him getting up, but the one who got up now living in you, not just him being raised, but the risen one being your life, then you have no hope. There's empty, vain faith, and you're still in your sin. It's all about that, isn't it? The resurrection, the one raised living in my soul is the true deliverance out from sin and death. That's why we read a while ago in Peter, this is all brought about. This baptism that saves us is about an altogether new conscience, a new understanding that is joined to one raised. Not just cleaning this up, but one living. Living in me, made unto my soul that which only he is. And if he not, and if he be not raised, your faith is in vain because there is no grace to access. There is no peace with God to know. There is no man to know. And you're still in this state because the risen one is the only means out from this man. Because it's not about you crawling out. It's about him being your salvation, your way, your door. And he's going to go on here and even further clarify that because he's going to get into these two men of chapter 15. And that's the same two men he's referring to in Romans 5 and 6. We're going to go down a little bit. Now is Christ risen from the dead, verse 20. We'll get into verse 17 and 18 in another class because that's important too. Because that, well, it's important. If in, oh, I'm sorry, verse 20. I mean, 17, 18, 19. That's, that's, we'll get into that and how that relates. Verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead. And become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. That's the same thing he says in Romans 5.12, isn't it? What we read earlier. For as in Adam all die. Here it is. So also, or even so, in Christ shall all who are in Christ be made alive or have life. Now, this is what we're looking at. I'm going to stop there. I want you to look at these verses in chapter 15, and I want you to see the parallel of chapter 6, and then we'll talk about it. But I want you to look at it. I want you to have time to just think about it. Look at it. This is, some, this is an area where, where many disagree, and where you may disagree with me. And people here may disagree with me here. But this is what the Lord is sharing with my heart, and I have to share it with you. We cannot dispense, you know, I'm, I'm not even talking about eschatologically. I'm talking about just now, presently, with regard to our salvation and the state of being that this man has brought about and determined in our soul. 
we cannot continue to dispensationalize these things and make one another step and one another step and another step and then another step and then you'll reach the goal. We have to understand the goal has reached us. The end of the matter is now our life. The end of God's ultimate aim and intention is the one who dwells in our soul and the Father's pleasure is to make the soul to know the one who is there. And the one who is there is life himself, is the salvation and deliverance from a from this man of sin, and that is a present state. Dead to sin, alive unto God, is a present state that must be recognized and reckoned and acknowledged in the face of the perfect man who is our life. And if that is not a recognition, just a present state, not a recognition, you will live in the deception and the condemnation because this man will still be the point of reference in your soul's view. May we see this clear, clean cut, this work of God, wrought of God, in His Son, and bestowed in grace to the soul. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for this time. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can email us. Uh, the, the website and all should be, should be there and you can go there and email us. My email is ravenbird at gmail.com. Uh, you can also go to the podcast that I'm doing. Uh, of course, we have the podcast for the Sunday services, the Midwest Center for Truth uh, Sunday services. That's a podcast on podbean.com. You can find that on our, on our homepage. You can also find my podcast, the Satisfied God podcast. Uh, on that as well. It's also on Podbean. And uh, you can go there and find a lot more sessions and classes and dealing with this right now, actually like we're dealing here. So go there if you wish. So contact me. Appreciate you being with us. Thanks. Amen.